and welcome to the Cracking the Cryptic podcast. I'm Peter C. Hayward. I'm Simon Anthony. And I'm Mark Goodliffe. And this is the world's number one Sudoku podcast, in which two of the world's greatest Sudoku solvers talk about the hobby that they love so much. Today, we are talking about Sudoku tournaments. Now, Mark and Simon, how, how many Sudoku tournaments have you gone to? Or puzzle to- is, is there a name for them? Puzzle tournaments? Oh, goodness, quite a few. I've been to the World Championship three times with Sudoku and three times with Puzzle championships i think and then uk championships on top of that so quite a few i don't know <laughs> mark will have done more i think i've been to six world championships although i never stay on for the puzzle part i leave as soon as the sudoku part is over and then there's a i've probably been in the been to eight or nine times sudoku championships two or three uk well no five or six uk ones i suppose and it's probably about it i mean it's it's still a fair few when you add them up now a lot of people are probably listening to this and saying wait a second what is this what is a sudoku championship is it just a bunch of people who bring the paper from home and sit there beside each other and do them while a teacher sits up the front and grades them so what yeah what does what, what does it look like what does a sudoku championship look like it is very like an exam hall full of people with scripts handed out to them the uh, starting gong goes and you're allowed to open the script and then you have a certain number of minutes each round to answer fully as many puzzles as possible within the time allowed and then they get taken away and marked. So it's really like a big exam, basically. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely is. And people voluntarily do this. (laughs) Not only do people voluntarily do it, other people voluntarily organise it provide puzzles for free and then mark them so yeah. there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of volunteering going on there. <laughs> my experience of this would be board game conventions which i suspect is a very different beast so uh, I, I make and design board games and play a lot of board games and board game conventions of which there are dozens and dozens and dozens are basically people getting together in a room and sitting down and playing board games and not stuff like that you've heard of like monopoly or risk or anything like that like the the new fancy board games that if, if you're into the board game hobby you'll be like yes of course that's a whole different thing uh, stuff like the Jelly Bean Games, who's the sponsor of this podcast. Little little plug there. And those are what I'm broadly imagining. But I also watched The Queen's Gambit recently. And The Queen's Gambit is, is kind of probably more similar, where it's a bunch of... In that show, there's a bunch of chess enthusiasts who get together to competitively play chess against each other. Yeah, I imagine it's... a. I mean, I haven't been to a board game convention, but uh, I presume there is a competitive element there as well as the sociability of it all. Um, I think it is quite a lot like the Queen's Gambit scenes of tournaments where there are, you know, a room full of people playing very seriously this hobby. And then uh, I think in the Queen's Gambit and in a typical chess tournament, people get eliminated down to very few. And you saw that a lot in the show. Whereas in our tournaments, pretty much everyone's in it until the final round or two. Oh, really? Hey, so how many people would go to, say, your average puzzle event world championships would be about 150 i would say something like that hey so they're they're they're, they're, they are more like the queen's gambit then um just for context gen con is the world's biggest board game convention that gets seventy thousand people so it's a very different scale that we're imagining oh good grief yeah yeah very different (laughs) i mean to go to the world championship you have to qualify you know you have to get onto your national team which is normally sort of four people something like that so it's it's maxed out by the number of countries and but there's sometimes there's an a and a b team and you know (laughs) yeah that's exactly right i think countries can send two teams of four people and then it's just however many countries decide to attend and some of those will send one team and others will send two hey so it's literally like a room with a bunch of people solving puzzles correct yep and repetitively like you know that happens again and again (laughs) throughout the day and do you have to pay to go to them are these are these paid events yeah yeah they're paid uh i mean the pay the, the cost isn't very high but you do have to pay for a room at the location as well as the entry fee for the tournament so uh and and, and of course are we talking 10 pounds or 100 pounds what, what sort of um it depends where you're flying to really because the flight is normally the cost because it is happening at one location in the world somewhere so the rooms and and the entry fee will be about 500 pounds or something like that feels about right 
Oh, okay. So by buying the ticket, you're, sorry, I'm getting very logistical because I'm fascinated by this stuff. So buying the ticket also gets you the room, basically. Yeah, I mean, they, they normally do it as a package that way because everybody needs a room. Gotcha. You know, you might be able to do it by staying locally or something, but nobody really tries that as far as I know. So in board game conventions, a big part of the scene is the vendor hall where you can go in and buy the newest and latest board games. Are there sales at these puzzle events? Um, I've seen them, but they're, they're pretty minor. Although at the American Crossword Puzzle Tour, there is a very similar vendor hall where, where there are a lot of stalls selling things. And what are, what are they selling? Like cr crossword books? Uh, crossword books and crossword novelties and... Pencils? Or anything that can be either connected with crosswords or vaguely connected with crosswords, <laughs> like quiz books or so... Jeopardy cheat sheets or something. I don't know. <laughs> I've got to know, what is a crossword novelty? <laughs> oh, well, I mean, there are... There are... There are ties and mugs and uh, there are uh, suits I've seen in crossword designs, um, bags and just all sorts of things. Prank crosswords where there's no correct answer and you give it to someone and they spend an hour trying to solve it? <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> I, I, bought, I, bought, I bought a crossword book actually at the New York uh, Times, or the, sorry, the American Crossword Puzzle Tournament. It was it was something like filthy crosswords. <laughs> It's a crossword book full of obscene crosswords. And it's very funny, actually. I've still got it. Crosswords for the bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Adults only Sudoku books. <laughs> One of the best Sudoku books I picked up was a book of uh, Sudokus all with only 17 given digits, classic Sudokus. And uh, oh, lovely. A, a hundred puzzles like that. And that's the sort of thing you only find at a convention, in my view. So another big part of the, again, board game scene and also in Queen's Gambit, the chess tournament scene, is the social life. So is there a big, are there social events? Do people go out drinking? But probably not before the tournament, but after the tournament? Um, no. There is a real social aspect to it, you know, and all the teams are very friendly and you have your meals together. And, you know, I've made lots of very good friends from meeting them at, at the tournaments. But there isn't, it doesn't tend to revolve very much around sort of alcohol. Right, I know it won the World Sudoku Championship. But... Oh, I, I, I don't think you've seen the seamy side. <laughs> no one invited Simon to the parties. Oh, no, no, clearly not. There's a regular karaoke evening at the, at the World Puzzle Championship, and uh, there's plenty of alcohol around. There's often a football game. True. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure whether that was what you were meaning, Pete. I'm, I'm just enjoying the idea that this is the moment Simon realised he was never invited to the parties. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's probably true. I mean, I've always been NFI'd. <laughs> Mark's like, no, there, there's, there's, there's a huge social scene and we all hang out for two days after the... Oh, did you? Oh, oh no. <laughs> so with, with these uh, events, how, you know, in, in normal times, how often would one be held? Like one every six months, one every year, one every two months? Oh, they're kind of annual events, all of them. Anything I know is an annual event. And, and there are several of them, so you could go to one every four months if you wanted to? There's the World Championship every year. There are, you'll have a national championship for your own country that'll be a face-to-face -face event. And then there might be in your country a newspaper event or something like that. So there's probably a maximum of three face-to-face -face events that you could go to in a year, I would have thought. We can maybe infer what the demographics are, but would you say it's a uh, a, a male-dominated event? Uh, is, is there a lot of women puzzle solvers? I mean, I know there are a lot of women setters uh, on the channel, and I'm sure that you guys get many amorous emails, but um, <laughs> what, what, would the, what would the standard kind of audience look like at one of these events? I'm skipping over that allegation. It's about 75% male, I would say, so <laughs> male-dominated is probably right but oh, yeah. not, not exclusively. What I always find quite interesting is that at a crossword tournament, I tend to be younger than the average age, but at a Sudoku tournament, I'm far older than the average age, which uh, is a slightly different demographic for the two types. Oh, interesting. So is there a lot of overlap between like the crossword crowd and the Sudoku crowd? None. Oh, really? There's me. I, I am the Venn diagram intersection. Huh, cause... Well, maybe one or two other people who might consider going to both, but no, there is none. Huh, again, my, my introduction to both of these worlds is through you two, and I know that obviously Cracking the Cryptic started as Cryptic Crosswords and now it's Sudoku, so I just assumed that, you know, they're both in the paper, so they both kind of have the same audience. Um, not really, no. They, they have different audiences and they generally, the participants, dislike the other discipline. <laughs> 
Uh, so Simon, have you ever been to a crossword event, or are you only a, a Sudoku event person? No, no, I I go to the Times Crossword Tournament every year, basically just to get irritated. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in in the UK there is only one uh, one crossword event. The, the Telegraph had one a few years ago, actually. That's that's the only other one I've been to in the UK. And then we've also been to the US Crossword Tournament twice, Mark, or is um... is that wrong? I think I think I've been twice. I don't think more than yeah. We went we went twice. We both went in the same two years. Yeah, some some years apart from each other. Yeah. So this is something that you'll travel internationally for. Yeah, yeah. I mean the the US crossword tournament is that's very good fun actually. It's sort of it's more seasoned I think than the World Sudoku Championship is. And you know Will Shorts runs a pretty tight ship. And, you know, they've got very, you know, clear timetable. I think I think that's where the World Sudoku Championship will end up at some point. You know, they'll have they'll have really efficient commentary on the finals and stuff like that. And then it'll all be televised in, you know, in a year or two's time. I was just going to say the social scene in uh, the US Crossword Tournament is a bit more developed as well in that. There are planned times for socialising and there's a talent competition at the end of the show where a crossword has got talent <laughs> takes place and you get crossworders singing or doing comedy routines. Is it all crossword yeah. specific stuff? <laughs> no, oh no, no, it's very serious. Yeah, or well, some people take it very seriously indeed. It was, it's a real eye-opener, I have to say. Um, Do they hand out a blank schedule uh, so it's just a grid and they give you all the events and you have to work out the correct <laughs> order of the events within the grid and uh, solve it. There's only one solution if you can get it, then you can go to all the events in the correct order. No, no but that does bring us on to <laughs> mystery hunts. Oh, yes, yes, tell me. Which is another social event that occurs and well worth talking about, where um, there's one or two in the UK every year, normally, where teams will gather together at a certain point somewhere, normally in London, and be given, pretty much as you said there, a, they'll be given a brief introduction and a sheet of puzzles, and they will have to walk between various areas of the city to solve new puzzles and move on. And you're timed for each of the times you have a puzzle available to you until you finish it, and then there's a winner at the end of the event. And this is sort of the origin of the puzzle hunts that you guys have run on the channel, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose so. It's, yeah, it's sort of, yeah, it's a physical variant of that. So when, when, the, when the illness ends and we're allowed to go outside again, uh, are you guys expecting there to be a, a greater number of people at these events based on the success of the channel? Do you think you'll have a noticeable impact on them? No, I, I don't think we, we've had any effect on it. But I do think that the world has moved dramatically sort of in favor of this sort of hobby in recent years because when they first ran dash which is the most sort of famous one that that's come to the uk anyway probably 10 years ago i would guess was around the first time it appeared in the uk and there were very few participants and you know you could just you could rock up on the day if you wanted you didn't have to book you know and they were just grateful to see you and in recent years it's it's a bun fight to actually be able to participate because there's only a limited number of slots and it's become so popular now it's it's just brilliant and it, i think it shows it's sort of geek chic if you like it, it, being a geek is a lot less <laughs> uh, of a stigma than it used to be and you know you see all sorts now going you know kids going husbands and wives bringing each other along you know and, and often saying oh i never thought i'd do this but then they actually go and have a really good time so yeah it's good have you two brought your uh, wives or children to any of these events no <laughs> i once brought brought my daughter to uh, a mystery hunt actually so i have done that once yeah um and as simon says mystery hunts have been growing organically i mean really hard long before cracking the cryptic they were growing fast in recent years i think that sudoku tournaments I don't know. It'll be very interesting to see if Sudoku tournaments have got more attempting participants than two years ago. So that's an interesting question, actually. Are either of your spouses puzzle solvers? Are they, are they into the Sudoku? Mine is positively, she hates it. She thinks that the whole of puzzle solving dis destroys people's minds and uh, <laughs> leads them to believe that life's problems have single correct solutions, which is completely inappropriate. 
So uh, she's very, very opposed to puzzles in general. Wow. Have I just brought up all sorts of marital strife? Uh, yeah, yeah. No, this is this goes deep, Peter. This, goes, <laughs> this is years of therapy. Is, is this why you're afraid to tell people? <laughs> it's probably part of it. Simon, when I asked that question about Simon, you got, you got a look of true fear on your face. Is, is there a similar story with your uh, relationship? Yeah, it is. It's, it absolutely is. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, my wife isn't very interested in puzzles but she's not positively against them if you see what i mean so she wouldn't tell me you know not to do them on a saturday because you know it's inappropriate or anything like that have you two told your wives about the youtube channel yet uh, i did mention it a couple of years ago but i've not mentioned it since <laughs> what does she think you're doing in the attic every day <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, guitar practice that's why he has to play it every now and again well sometimes she she does unlock the door and let me out but most of the time you know, she expects me to stay here. 18 years ago when we first had a magpie social event after the first year of our crossword magazine together um, we did bring our wives to that and uh, one of our future collaborators was delighted and given that our pseudonyms are pieman and mr magoo he greeted them with ah pie woman and mrs magoo which i thought was a nice touch <laughs> <laughs> was that well received or did that, uh... oh they, they loved it yeah oh, that's lovely. it did go down well so let's jump into the competitive side of these events mark in one of your videos you talked about the uh the scammer the infamous uh the, the man who cheated the tournament eugene varshavsky <laughs> yes we, we won't go into that full story right now but it is a fantastic video that i recommend that at the end of that one you showed someone sort of on a stage solving a sudoku on like easel in front of everyone is, is that a common element of these in these contests um it was i think mm. the first couple of world sudoku championships finished with an easel on the stage a whiteboard that people were expected to solve their sudoku on i think that has gone out now people sit get to sit at desks in playoffs and do puzzles you can't closely see what they're doing normally unless somebody has set up a camera above them but it's a bit variable how that playoff system works and one year recently, they didn't even have a playoff system. They just said that whoever had scored the most in the ordinary rounds of puzzles was the winner. And there was no playoff. So it is it is a slightly variable format. Where's the sense of drama? I know. It was very, very surprising. <laughs> and is there prize money? Like, can you do you actually win anything beyond the, the fame and glory? Don't think there is prize money as such. I'm, I might be wrong. And apologies to the sponsors of any of the tournaments if I've been wrong. The, the one at which uh, the... the apparent cheating happened there was there was a ten thousand dollar prize fund wow so, <laughs> that's quite yeah, a jump yeah. from nothing to ten thousand dollars well <laughs> that was an american national tournament rather than a world one but i don't think the world championships have had prize money certainly not of significant size at all so sudoku as a, as a get rich quick scheme is not a not an effective path no not solving it probably not even setting it and then have you two ranked actually i've got a video of you two open now simon is the former uk <laughs> team member in world sudoku and world puzzle championships and mark is the time sudoku champion so are these are these from these events these titles uh yeah well i've won that time sudoku event twice uh while it was running they've stopped it now unfortunately even before covid so was it because you just kept on winning they were like this is this is just boring just the one man <laughs> no 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 far from it i was very any time i did win i was very lucky i was never the best competitor in the room at the that event you just bifurcated in the right direction <laughs> no somebody else made a mistake that's how you win it <laughs> that's the trick i hope everyone's writing this down <laughs> tips on competitive sudoku <laughs> you are in a rush so anybody can make a mistake the one year i finished first i didn't win because i'd made a mistake but the the two years i did win i didn't finish first by finished first you mean fastest not yes exactly yes. not not most correct my best finish was 30th one year now it does take a slight caveat because there were more than 29 people who <laughs> did better than me in the competition. But because I had qualified for my national team and some of them hadn't, the, the, my world position was 30th. And I, I never expect to do better than that. That was as good as I can be. Right, so so top, top 30 in the world. Yeah, and I think I was 60th at best. So some way below that. But to be honest... That's the, the other thing is that 60th in the world, you may think that's impressive, but it's just not because the difference between, you know, me and to be honest, Mark and the top 15 in the world is pretty stark. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost difficult to explain. You know, it would be like 
I don't know, a 400 meter runner running against Usain Bolt in the 100 meters. You know, the 400 meter runner is going to be seconds right. behind. And seconds is a lot in this case. <laughs> yeah. It is. It is. I mean, a lot, though. But I mean, so many seconds. People who know that I've won the Times Sudoku competition or crossword competitions have sort of waved me off to the world championships and said, I hope you win. And I just, I can't explain to them how insane that notion is. I cannot possibly win. Mm. I might, you know, if... Except your wife who says, I hope you lose. <laughs> oh, she doesn't wish me ill. She just doesn't value puzzles. <laughs> but... Uh, Can she hear you? You're, you're glancing off the side. Already. She might be around. Who knows? <laughs> She's behind you. <laughs> the next episode will be uh, Sudoku uh, couples counselling. It'll be a whole episode. Where we... <laughs> in, in the world, you two are at, at best top 50 top 60 top 100 yeah yeah correct like not to rub it in I, I know that this is very hurtful for you but uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to get a gauge of well and and a lot of people have got very much better in the last couple of years we can see their times in some of the online competitions so we are dropping down as we speak yeah yeah but on the other hand we are doing slightly different puzzles now on a daily basis so you know if there was a world sudoku championship with monstrously hard Sudokus with impossible break-ins that couldn't be bifurcated, we might come higher up in that competition. Yeah, yeah. I would I would rate Simon's chances reasonably, not to win it perhaps, but to be in the top 20 or so very highly in that. So we just need to reshape the competition around your strengths and then you'll do quite well. Yeah, around <laughs> ourselves. Yeah, and if there was a golf element, then that would be <laughs> ideal. <laughs> Yeah, the, the StarCraft golf guitar playing Sudoku championship. You'd be you'd be right up there. Uh, I know who I'd be backing for that. And so what sort of Sudokus are at these champions? Because if, if it's not the monstrously hard break-ins that people are familiar with through the channel, what, what sort of things are we talking? They are relatively approachable puzzles, we would call them on the channel, where there will be a few classics, but an awful lot of variants of fairly traditional types, which take the absolute experts five-ish minutes take people like me and simon eight or nine minutes you know there's there's a there's a wide difference between those speeds but obviously there's a difference between the types of puzzle and some puzzles suit other people more than others but there will be maybe you'll be given a round of maybe 60 minutes with a booklet of 14 puzzles and you'll be incredibly amazed when you get to about 45 minutes and you hear someone put their hand up and shout finished while you're struggling on your sixth puzzle or something. Yeah. That's the way it works. So it's more like tapas than a, a, a big meal. It is. That's a very good analogy. Yeah. But it's also quite psychologically damaging, I think, for for people like me and possibly Mark, because the exam analogy is very accurate. You know, whenever we've done exams in our lives, we've probably expected to be reasonably good at them. And here it's incredibly... <laughs> this, this might be unique to you, Simon. <laughs> this is the thing that everyone listening is like, what is he talking about here? Who who goes into exam expecting to be good at it? That's uh, this, this might be a very specific Simon Anthony comment. <laughs> Oh, no, sorry. Um, no, but I do sort of feel... I've always felt, like, relatively like I shouldn't be dreadful at the exam. And, like, these Sudoku and puzzle competitions, the you know, your inadequacy is just laid bare before you. It is very difficult to to take, in a way, you know, because you're just... It's so clear that the people that are also in the exam hall with you are better than you, and sometimes so much better than you you can't really even begin to understand how it can be possible to be that far ahead i don't take simon's view at all i don't i don't see it that way my expectations are so much lower that you know i'm just hoping to finish a fair number of puzzles in the right time and yep. see where that ranks me i'm not expecting to be in the top 10 or 50 it's not it's not something that bothers me uh mark this is where we tell simon simon we, we actually invented these sudoku champions just to bring you down a notch we were like look you're going into every exam feeling like you're going to be good at it it's not healthy so we, we set up this elaborate international system just so you could sit there and feel like the rest of us do an exam <laughs> And uh, yeah, this, this feels like the appropriate moment to tell you. <laughs> well, th thanks for that. <laughs> Simon, Simon actively seeks out pursuits in which he's not the best so he can feel annoyed about them. Oh, that's a harsh comment. <laughs> <laughs> we are charging you for this therapy, Simon. Uh, you'll, be, you'll be glad to know. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, so in in the world t- top hundred generally, top fifty on a good day. What about what about in England? How how would you two rank yourselves in uh, in the England Sudoku scene? Until recently, because obviously you've made the you've made the championship, so you can't be can't be at the very bottom. Yeah, I think the first time I got in, I thought I was a bit lucky. I was probably fifth or sixth in the country and got into the top four. Then for a few years, I think I was comfortably in the best four now i'm probably just outside it so at sudoku you know somewhere in the top six or seven but i don't know exactly where it's quite interesting because we never competed at the same time because you you were sort of you could take or leave sudoku for a while couldn't you You sort of enjoyed doing it but didn't feel terribly competitive about it and in those years yeah i snuck into the team a few times but then i i I stopped doing it yeah then you kind of moved on to the pencil puzzle side for a little bit before you kind of dropped out entirely from the competitive scene and i've never been anywhere rankable in the pencil puzzle side at all i just okay so let's let's talk about what a pencil puzzle is in this case well this is a so obviously there's cryptic crosswords, which which people know. There's Sudoku, which by this point in the podcast you should know. And then, I mean, Sudoku is technically a subset of, of pencil puzzle. Correct. What, what else would, would yeah. fill that category? Pencil puzzles is really the older brother of Sudoku and in, includes huge numbers of forms of normally little square puzzles with cells that look a bit like a Sudoku puzzle but have widely differing rules and some of the Kokuro is a type that people may well be familiar with but there are lots that don't involve numbers that are just shading puzzles like Nurikabi and Tapa and well Philomino and Slitherlink and Numberlink Simon can probably name Castle Wall Castle Wall indeed Simon Snake Pit Simon can name dozens of others I'm sure yeah I mean they used to be quite familiar to i suppose puzzle aficionados in the uk because so so many of them were released by the company nikoli the japanese company and they had a website where people would compete daily on sort of five or six puzzles that would be released that day handcrafted um and it was just a brilliant website and and then because of i mean it's a situation where technology actually went backwards because the i don't know whether it was adobe or java or something changed anyway and the nickley system just fell over uh, and so that's disappeared it's disappeared it's no longer happens oh no that's a shame but yeah as mark said it's those sorts of puzzles of which Sudoku is a subset. And Simon, th- those sorts of puzzles are more your strength than Sudoku, you'd say? No, I don't know. I'm not, I wouldn't say any, anything was particularly a strength, but I enjoy them. I really do. I like the logic of them. And I really like uh, some of the Sudokus we solve on the channel where you get a hybrid puzzle, which takes a pencil puzzle logic and overlays Sudoku on top of it. I really like those puzzles. And the only reason we don't do more of them is because the rules can be so difficult to explain. So there's a puzzle <laughs> I've wanted to do on the channel for ages that I've seen on Logic Masters Germany by the constructor Jesper. Uh, and it's a hybrid of Masu and Sudoku. And, you know, I sort of say to Mark, we should have a go at this on the channel. Do you want to do it? Do I want to do it? And he says, you can't do it on the channel because, you know, you have to explain the rules of Masu and, you know, the rules of Matthew are not easy to understand if you've never done it. So, you know, there would be a 10 minute introduction to the video and then, you know, it would probably be a very long solve as well. So, yeah, I don't know. You, you could do a Matthew puzzle one day, then the next day do this one and be like, now for the rules of Matthew, just go back one video and watch that one. <laughs> just go. Yeah, just go. Yeah. But I, I do think it's a shame, though. I mean, a lot of people, if you if you look at our Discord server, which is an astonishing number of people now on it. It's a small country, basically. <laughs> yeah. And an awful lot of them are very, very very into the pencil puzzle side of puzzling and would love us to cover more pencil puzzles on the channel and you know i'm i'm all for that basically but you know we sort of have to be driven a bit by our audience and it is true to say that when we do do pencil puzzles they tend to be less watched than the sudoku puzzles so we have to find a way of marrying the two up because i don't i don't want to lose the pencil puzzles but at the same time we we obviously can't do too many pencil puzzles or i think we'll shrink which would be not good the uh, yeah yeah the, the opposite of the direction that you're trying to go there's obviously crossword championships yeah. and then there's uh in the early days of sudoku were there just pencil puzzle championships of which sudoku were a part like when did they kind of break out into their own thing correct yeah uh so there were people will hate me for not knowing the facts but i think there were about 11 or 12 puzzle champ world puzzle championships before sudoku developed as a separate form and then they added on a sudoku championship 
And I think even even to this day, the, the organizers of these events kind of see Sudoku as more a subset. And, you know, they kind of understand that they have to give it a separate tournament. But the, the Sudoku tournament's a little bit shorter than the puzzle tournament because I guess ostensibly because there's so much more variety in the puzzles. And I don't know. I, I, I find it quite interesting. I think our channel will probably have done a, an amount to level the two disciplines, as it were, between each other and make Sudoku a little bit more front and center. And so are these kind of one ongoing event where you go in for like five days and it's two days of pencil puzzles and three days of Sudoku? What does it look like? Yeah, it's kind of Monday and Tuesday for Sudokus. And then there's a rest a rest or a sightseeing day on Wednesday. A, a day where everyone except for Simon goes out and hangs out together? Correct. Oh, well, we're, and I fly home. <laughs> <laughs> and then on Thursday, Friday and Saturday morning will be the puzzles tournament. And then there's a kind of prize giving on Saturday evening or something. Gotcha. And so how many different countries have you gone to puzzle events at? Um, I've been to Bulgaria, China, India. Oh, oh, uh, I've done one in the UK, uh, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic. Wow. So it's really all over. Yeah, yeah. Simon's done Poland, a different event in India. Where else have you been, Simon? Uh, Czech Republic. I want to say Belarus, actually. I think I went to Minsk, but that could be wrong. You think you went to Winsk? <laughs> Minsk, to Minsk. I didn't go to Win Winsk. I, went you, to, I think I went to Minsk. You might have gone to Minsk, but you don't remember. You're just yeah. always jet-setting from puzzle tournament to puzzle tournament. Yeah. It's, uh, it all blows think... together. <laughs> It does a bit. I feel like most people know if they've been to Minsk. <laughs> <laughs> I think I did have to. Yeah, I think going to Minsk was quite difficult because you had to get a special visa. But this, I mean, this is a long time ago now. This would be at least 10 years ago, I would say. So, I, you know, I can't remember what I had for breakfast. So don't. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that brings me to my next question, which is, um, what did you guys have for breakfast today? <laughs> I'll let Simon go for it. <laughs> Hang on, let me look at my notes. <laughs> check, check my journal. So, are there? Are there? Obviously, there's some events in England, but is England like a big player in these kind of uh, things, or is England like a? No, they're most popular in Japan, I believe. No, not at all. Not in terms of the best solvers, but we're quite embedded in the uh, machinery. So we have setters who will be setting puzzles for these events, and Britain will be on the on the rotation to host them, and so on. So. You know, they're, they're involved, but we, we don't have anybody who's claiming to be in the top five in the world or anything. And are there like stars at these events that you go and you're like, oh, it's Ken Endo, or, you know, are there, are there Sudoku celebrities? Oh, yeah. I mean, I look up to so many of these people. I mean, people like Thomas Snyder, Wei Hua Huang, Ulrich Voigt, Kota Morinishi. I mean, these are, these people are gods to me. Absolutely gods. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And even people like... Do you know if any of them watch the channel? I think sometimes, perhaps. I'm not sure. I think most of those guys find our <laughs> channel a bit pointless to them. It's like a little bit beneath them. So, <laughs> Mark, did you marry all of these people? Is that what's happening here? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, my wife watched a video on our channel the other day and thought it was quite good. This was a breakthrough, I felt. Oh, must have been one of Simon's then. I don't remember. <laughs> it was, it, was it one of yours or one of mine? <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, the other the other person I, I hugely look up to and I always look forward to seeing is David McNeil. So when we said earlier that there weren't many people who would sort of overlap with the crossword scene and Sudoku scene, David is definitely, he's in both camps. He's not super fast at sort of solving cryptic crosswords, but he is He's very quick, but in terms of his ability in puzzle solving and Sudoku solving, he's really exceptionally good. Uh, you know, proper, proper world ranked and just a very nice guy as well. I shared a room with him actually in Goa when we went to the world championship there. And he has a, <laughs> he's a bit like Mark actually in that at, at home, he's not, I don't think he has a lot of time to practice Sudoku <laughs> because he has a, he had a young family and he, you know, he spent a lot of time with them. So when he went to these events, he would literally use every hour as his practice. And when I say that, I mean he wouldn't go to bed. This is priority. So, you know, I would, go to, I would go to bed and I would see him sitting at the desk in the room sort of practicing. And I'd wake up and he'd still be sitting there practicing and he'd just oh, go wow. through the night. And his brain is so pliable and brilliant that just sort of, 
you know, nine hours straight Sudoku solving would sort of reconnect the neurons in such a way that he could then go and compete the following day brilliantly. Uh, it, it really, really has to be seen to be believed. And, he, you know, he did nearly win the classic Sudoku part of a world championship once. Yeah, they, yeah. they had, I think that's the one you were talking about. They had a classic Sudoku oh, wow. extra competition. He came second and only just. So he was the reason I was pausing when saying the UK doesn't really have anybody top ranked. Dave, David McNeil gets pretty close to yeah. it. But I remember Simon saying, well, you know how after you've done a round or two, your brain feels fried. I don't think David's feels that way at all. And I was <laughs> saying to him, well, I don't either. Like, I can just carry on. <laughs> <laughs> No. Some people, some people burn out, and some people get fueled by the. Uh... I don't want to compare myself to Dave McNeil, but I spent nine hours on a Sudoku the other day and uh, couldn't, couldn't work out how to progress. Got zero digits in the grid, so um, pretty much the same thing. I think we could all agree. Oh, was that was that the fl- that was the fluster puzzle, wasn't it? Did you? Yes, yes. I, I left a comment that. on the video. I yeah, spent nine that's... hours. It was my day off, yeah. so I was like, I'm going to spend nine hours on this, and uh, <laughs> I couldn't get it. I, I didn't. It was a very good puzzle. You have to add up all of the different killer cage sums and divide by five and i just didn't think to do that so I, I got some brilliant brilliant logic that didn't actually get many digits in the grid it was a really interesting time <laughs> uh so now now i'm ready for the tournaments <laughs> have you guys attended any of these uh, events since starting the channel no, i haven't have you mark i think th- yeah i there was one that occurred after we'd been doing the channel for six months but frankly we were still doing more crosswords than sudoku at the time so i don't think i think maybe one person came up to me and said they'd seen me do a video on sudoku and so what, what do you think it would be like if, if you went now like after the pandemic ends are you guys planning on going back to some or oh, i'd certainly like to uh, simon's not really a tournament attender anymore he's I not know. that interested in that side of it after, after you got disillusioned bastian did say you know oh, it would be really good if you turned up at least i mean i think it would be nice to go because i do have a lot of you know friends who i'd like to see again but in terms of competing goodness no there's no point me going could could you guys be commentators could you guys uh, sit there and i could i could commentate yeah (laughs) (laughs) i've normally gone when i've qualified for the uk a team that was kind of my mark i wouldn't bother going if i wasn't in the top four in the uk but I think these... You wouldn't be allowed to go. Well, you can normally get in somehow. The back door, maybe. <laughs> I, do, I do think, if, you know, if there is an event next year... I... No, I, I, meant, I meant by your wife, not by the actual... <laughs> oh, <I see>. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, that always was an issue, was she would, like, what, you're going... You know, you want to go for a week, if I suggested doing the puzzles bit as well. And I was like, well... And she goes, a week off work to do puzzles. <laughs> What, what about now that it's your job? Has that attitude shifted? Sorry, not, not, not to dive too deeply into your marriage. <laughs> that is a slight change, yes. And uh, have you guys ever considered, like, maybe after the pandemic ends, holding your own Sudoku tournament and making it like a, a event, a cracking the cryptic event? I, I haven't, no. I mean, there is a part of me, and I haven't got time to do it, so it's a complete, you know, it's just a pipe dream. But I would like to hold a puzzle tournament that was immune to bifurcation just to see what happened <laughs> I w- i'd just be interested to see whether it was the same people who still won or whether or whether you know <laughs> no it wouldn't be it wouldn't be me that won but whether whether somebody would emerge who had a different way of thinking and rather than it being just pure speed of sort of calculation Thing to be a bit more creative thinking test Dedu- deduction rather than just processing yeah yeah I'd be interested to see that in my mind, at least. <laughs> Mark's shaking his head. He's like, that's not real speed solving. I, it, correct. That's exactly what I think. And I don't think you could make a bifurcation free tournament anyway. So between Simon, Mark and Mark's wife, we have three very different approaches to these uh, <laughs> to these puzzles. Uh, so of, of the various uh, that you've gone to, uh, what, what, have, what have been the highlights? Like, what, have, what have been the, the best moments that you've experienced at these events? Watching the finals is just an incredible experience to me. Watching people solve at speeds that you cannot comprehend. Like in the, they have a Grand Prix final as a kind of filler in one evening normally and you can get the puzzles at the same time as the competitors and look at what they're solving and then you have to jump in a car and solve them while driving really fast around the track you'd virtually think so but the speed that these guys (laughs) achieve is just baffling and it really is thrilling to see how how good people can be at that i i enjoy that yeah it's seeing real genius is very you know it's a privilege and it's quite rare i think to be able to do that in 
normal life in, in at least in a way that you can r- truly appreciate that what you're what you're watching is special you know we can watch a footballer score a great goal but if you go on youtube there'll be thousands of great goals sc- scored and none of us are footballers so probably our ability to appreciate whether what we're watching is really genius is is not perfect whereas all of us on on this podcast have a pretty good idea about sudoku we're fairly <laughs> into the nuts and bolts of it and when you see you know when you see these people and what they can do it really is humbling and it's interesting and it feels a bit like you're in the presence of you know rain man or something very special going on other highlights for me would be david mcneil again singing danny boy in the karaoke competition in india and finding out he had the sort of the voice of an angel as well that was a surprise any personally Um, anytime i finish a round by completing a puzzle within the last 15 (laughs) seconds of the time it's absolutely thrilling because this is a huge difference to your score if you do finish it you get an extra 50 points say if you don't you just don't get them and 50 points is huge so it's such i literally get a massive adrenaline buzz if that happens i mean even if i've had a terrible round but i've finished one puzzle just at the end you've no idea it really feels special this is why your wife doesn't like it she's like you're getting high again you're going out there you're doing these puzzles there you, you go. come home you know hepped up on sudoku <laughs> with numbers flying out of you out of your mouth and we just can't calm you down do people like sit around and, and discuss like sudoku theory is, is that a thing that that happens or is it sort of because they're these like little kind of tapas things where they're very simple just a lot of them is, is that less of a less of an angle? It, it is less of an angle. I think if if we had the sort of tournament Simon was talking about earlier where the break-ins were hard, maybe people would. But I don't think this is what they're mostly discussing. I was just going to say, I remember in Poland, actually, I got to spend a few minutes with Ulrich Voigt, who is the most successful uh, puzzle solver in history. You know, he's won the world championship. I'm going to do him a disservice here. Let's just invent a number, something like 12 times or something. It's absurd. And I asked him about, I think it was magnets puzzles. And, you know, just spending 10 minutes in his company, you know, where he he, he was dissecting the logic of a magnets puzzle. It was incredible to me, the amount I didn't know and the amount, he, you know, his ability to teach so i think that's why these channels you know have longevity and and interest for people because you know there are so many tricks and tips that the average punter will never be exposed to or never find out unless they're introduced to them by things like cracking the cryptic and then on, on the other end what have been some of the uh Maybe some of the things that haven't gone as well in these events. Oh, God, I remember in Goa, the, the first round was a round of classic Sudoku. I think I talked about this on another podcast. And it was, I think the round was scheduled for 20 minutes or something absurd. And there were eight puzzles to do. And these were all sort of quite difficult classics. We're not talking about things where you can just write the digits in. You know, they've all got some, you know, a hidden triple or, some, you know, something that makes them at least fiendish and possibly super fiendish. If you're listening to this in the UK and you do the Times Sudoku, you'll know of what I speak. And, you know, after 12 minutes, people are putting their hand up saying, I'm done. You know, they're, they're averaging 90 seconds on these puzzles. So 20 minutes was not enough time. It should have been should have been closer to 10, 15. Oh, God. sorry. It was too much time. Too much yeah, time. I mean, it's too much time. And Whereas you know, for people like me, and you know, I think I was, you know, I was finishing my third puzzle at that point. I was just like, <laughs> why has that person just put their hand up? You know, have they have they lost their paper? Has they, you know, has a pencil gone blunt or something? So they need to go to the bathroom. and They need to ask teacher. <laughs> yeah, no, no, they finished, and then you know, then all around the room, everyone else is finishing, and it's sort of, whoa, this is this is different gravy. <laughs> Um, Simon told me a great story from Goa where during one of the rounds of Sudoku the lights went out due to some sort of power cut <laughs> yeah, that's right. and one competitor was seen to reach into his bag grab his torch and keep solving <laughs> <laughs> and he was British we were very proud of that good cub scout uh, for Americans listening a torch is a flashlight uh, thank you a flashlight uh, they, they, did, they, they did not pull out a, a, a hunk of wood and light it on fire uh, dedicated though that would have been <laughs> <laughs> Although that would be a bit more authentic, I think. Um, there have been some fantastic f- flops at uh, times competitions as well. There was one crossword competition where we were about 25 seconds into solving, having been just given the go. 
And then the organizer suddenly goes, stop, everybody stop, because he had failed down one column of competitors to hand back a sheet in which they were meant to fill in their competitor number against their name, <sighs> which was part of the marking process. So he stopped the whole competition for 25 seconds. I watched people around me not, you know, some of us responsibly turned over our papers <laughs> and pretended not to be thinking about the clues, whereas one or two people just left them the same way and just kept reading the clues and solving them in their heads. Unbelievable, unbelievable organisation. Mark, wasn't there a situation where somebody in the UK Championship didn't get given all the puzzles or something. Wasn't it Nina Pell or...? No. Well, <laughs> you know, that Nina Pell was in a final one year, an eight-person final, uh, at which we were handed four sheets, each with a puzzle on, and told to go. When the round was over, the organiser blithely announced that Nina had actually been given five sheets, one of which was a duplicate of one of the others, and had solved all five puzzles. <laughs> But he didn't think it would affect the winner <laughs> of the tournament, <laughs> and it, it, who was someone else. <laughs> it's just like utterly baffling that that could happen. <laughs> there was another event at which the final began, um, and ten minutes later, another competitor joined the final because it had been realised that he'd handed in two versions of a puzzle earlier on, one of which he hadn't finished. He'd asked for a new script finished it correctly and handed both in, but they had not managed to take that into account during the marking and had realised just as the final was beginning that he should be in it. So, so they threw him in 10 minutes late and <sighs> gave him extra time to see if he could match the times. Oh, I was going to say, if he won with that, with that <laughs> handicap, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> he was also the first to finish. I mean, so, some of these events that you just can't believe what they do. Like I, one of the... Uh, Eastern European ones, there was a sudden late announcement that a puzzle in one round had been replaced with another because the first one had been found to have two solutions. Oh, no. Just, well, <laughs> this is it. So the printed booklet was changed. And you had to, we had to wait 15 minutes while the new booklets came from the printer. Oh. And I was furious because I had a flight to catch that at the end of that morning. But then it turned out that the later round, the last round that I was due to compete in, had been cancelled because that puzzle also had a problem. So I was <laughs> able to make my flight. It's just amazing. Yeah, I think at the final of the World Puzzle Championship, uh, one of the ones I went to, Ulrich Voigt, the way it works, uh, Peter, is that basically you, you have two days of exams and you all get <laughs> a score at the end of that. And depending on your score, that sort of equates to a time in the grand final. So they take the top eight people and, you know, the, the person who's in first position will have a, you know, a 10 minute lead going into a series of, say, six puzzles. And the first puzzle, I think, or the first or second puzzle had was not unique. And Ulrich, who was winning by miles was completely thrown by this because of course he's such a genius you know he was starting to doubt his own brain and he was absolutely apoplectic once the mistake was found because he was like this has affected his whole confidence in his brain yeah and you can shake it yeah it, it had shaken him really really badly i guess if you're bifurcating two solutions isn't as much of a, of a downside because it's just like oh you got one of them you're good yeah it wouldn't worry me at all <laughs> <laughs> uh, in a in a video once, Simon, you mentioned that um, in one of the early Sudoku championships, the final puzzle required an X-wing to solve, and that was sort of controversial at the time. Oh goodness, yeah. I think if you go, um, Thomas Snyder used to write a blog, and I, I, as did I, although I'm not, I'm not not telling you where it is. It's still there <laughs> on the internet somewhere. But that was in the Czech Republic, I think, and the final, which was held on stage on uh, on whiteboards at that time. Uh, it was uh, just a simple X-Wing was the trick, but this was so outlandish at the time that they, they could have... What, what, what sort of time period are we talking about? Uh, I'd say around 2008, but I... 2006, that was, uh, in go. Luca, Italy. Was it Luca, Italy? Yeah. Okay. When uh, It was a Czech woman, Jana Tileva, who won the tournament. Right. And I think Tom, Thomas and the third place guy were pretty annoyed that the puzzle should reward bifurcating so clearly. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, too right. But but you know, look at how Sudoku solving has moved on now, because I think you know an awful lot of people would be relatively comfortable with swordfishes now. You know, it's not it's not such an unusual pattern, and certainly we've solved. And then you get to stuff like Fist of Fell's theorem, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, imagine if that was involved in a, a final puzzle for a. I think it would be fair now. That's exactly the point. I think it would be fair. I'd like like to see it. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. I guess it's been seventeen years, and so technology and technology, not in the sense of like electronics, but the technology of Sudoku has marched on, and we're all more all more comfortable with it. Yeah, it's interesting. So uh, that brings us to the end of the podcast. Any any final um, live event stories that you you, you wish to share? Oh, I can't think of any. I probably I probably could earlier. Any any late night Sudoku hookups that your wives don't know about? <laughs> Hasn't happened yet. I want to get all, all the goss on the, uh, on the podcast. <laughs> they don't listen. You can say whatever you like. It'll be fine. <laughs> oh, Mark, you could tell them about that woman. I think he's just made that one up. <laughs> all of that women I know are in Simon's life, thank God. <laughs> Good cover, Mark. Good cover. We all saw the look of fear on your face. <laughs> <laughs> who was the guy, Mark, who um, used to send me stuff? The guy who lived in Brighton. This is my Michael Trollope. Yeah, no, Michael, Michael Trollope. That's it. Yeah. Gosh, if I could find my old blog, I could find what he sent me. He used to send me these envelopes full of stuff. <laughs> this sounds seedy already. I love it. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think this probably isn't for this podcast. I I didn't know I don't I didn't know about these envelopes. Yeah, you. But did. I will tell you. You need to go into more detail here. This is sounding so sketchy. <laughs> uh, all sorts of things, like weird stuff. Like, um, are we talking anthrax or puzzles? Like, what, what sort of? No, no, not like that. But um, like underwear. You know, clippings from papers. You know, elastic bands. Michael Trollope featured in the best newspaper article about the Times Crossword Championship, which mentioned that of the twenty-four competitors, eighteen were male, seventeen wore spectacles but only one competed in his anorak that was michael troller and just after that tournament you asked earlier peter if there were big prizes for tournaments the fashion prize <laughs> no the sponsor of the times crossword tournament at the time was a website called wordcross who were trying to get going and become the crossword website and they sponsored a special tournament in covent garden uh with a mini and a car a new car is the prize and um i turned up i wasn't wow. invited to take part because i wasn't well known at the time <laughs> and i turned up to watch and one of my friends who was there said well you should ask them if you can compete you you had the fastest individual solve at the latest championship you know so very daringly i did and they said well we've got one spot left so okay and like i was suddenly in this competition to win a mini in which I finished second to Michael Trollope, which was very irritating. And then later he put that mini in an envelope and mailed it to Simon. It was a... <laughs> no, he just proudly, he proudly told us he sold it immediately, which was disappointing. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening to the Crack and the Cryptic podcast. Uh, this podcast is sponsored by Jellybean Games, which is my board game company. We make all kinds of games for families, for adults, for uh people who like games, people who don't like games. We've got, we've got everything. And you go to jellybean.games and actually use the promo code Bobbins to get 20% off your order. So tell us that the uh, that the podcast sent you and you'll get 20% off any order. Thanks so much, Mark and Simon. Uh, this has been delightful. I've learned so much uh, about your about your marriages. <laughs> and uh, it's been a pleasure. And I will talk to you next time on the Crack and Cryptic podcast. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Right.